I'm delighted to be talking about women's football. My name is David O'Reilly and I'm joined for this conversation, which we're calling Game Changers. And um, I should say straight away, that name has been stolen from Electric Ireland and all the wonderful stuff that they do uh, with local women's football. But I'm hoping that they won't mind. Whenever this was first um, pitched as an idea, the two people that I wanted to speak to that I thought would be best for this conversation both agreed. So I'm delighted to have Nicola. How are you doing? Nicola McCarthy, are you all right? Hi, David. Yes, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Marissa Callahan, how are you? I'm great, David. Thank you. That's me testing both your mics, you see, on the slide, but then ruining it, I say. <laughs> uh, so Nicola McCarthy um, is currently um, the face of the BBC's coverage, not just of women's football, but of um, coverage of the Irish League as well. I suppose a, a historic moment for you in the last few months was your involvement commentating on Glintour and winning the league, which was the first um, live football match on BBC TV, women's football match. Isn't that right? Did we get that right? So that was a big historic moment, wasn't it? Yeah, it certainly was, David. Yeah, and it was a, a real privilege to be part of it. Um, as you say, it was the first time we've streamed a, a women's game live on the BBC. We do have the, the highlights coverage uh, each each year, but yeah, it was a first for uh, for women's football, uh, and it was an absolute honour to be involved in it. It was such a big night, of course, with um, you know Glen Soren about to win uh, their first title in six years, uh, which they did. And uh, it was great to, to, to be part of the coverage and, uh, yeah, hopefully the start of, of Glendy Moore as well. Great, the Glentorn one. Sorry, Marissa. Uh, previous to that, Nicola has worked as Man City's um, correspondent for their own kind of social media and TV channels. Um, so, I mean, you literally have been knocking about on Pali with um, Kevin De Bruyne and Vincent Company and... And you've been on the on the open top bus when they've been kind of touring the, the Premier League trophy, um, which just blew my mind when I kind of saw all that footage. So how long were you in Manchester for doing that, Nicola? Yeah, a couple of uh, open top bus parades um, for, for, for City, which was uh, always a real highlight. And again, just a real privilege to be involved. So I started at Man City in the 2011-12 season, David, so that was... The season they won their first Premier League title. So if there was a time to start a job, it was pretty, pretty bang on to be fair. Um, so it was the famous uh, Sergio Aguero 93-20 goal uh, to win the league um, and pit Manchester United. So that I started that season and it only started a couple of months really whenever uh, they won the league. And I went on to spend five seasons uh, full time with Man City. And uh, then I went freelance and started working for BBC and Salford, but continued to um, to have a very close relationship with Manchester City as well, which has uh, lasted to, to this day. So, yeah, an incredible experience, really. I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, football in that time, a lot of change, both the men's and the, the, the women's game at Man City. Um, so it was, uh, when I look back now, I kind of think, my goodness, it was just <laughs> it was just an unreal time, as you say, to be in and around that team, that squad of players. Uh, some big names and great guys, you know, and, and on the women's side as well, some incredible players and just to watch firsthand the growth of the women's team, which only came into Man City in 2014 officially into the club, to kind of watch that growth and, and work alongside, you know, Steph Houghton and Jill Scott and Lucy Bronze and girls like that, you know, it was just an incredible time. So yeah, I've been very kind of fortunate to, to be on that journey really. It's very difficult for you to talk about your career to date without just name dropping all over the place. Because the, 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 <laughs> yeah. well, you know, and I'm, that's not even having a go at you. It, it, how can you know, <laughs> these are these are, and they all just seem to absolutely love you as well. You should say, Nicola, previous to that, um, and well, after that also, um, you are a footballer. You you played um for a number of different teams. I didn't realise that you actually played um alongside Marissa. We'll get to that in a wee moment, Marissa. To talk about your um kind of uh, journey, um. The, the, the reason why you know, it was just a, a complete no-brainer to ask you to do this was you, you're the captain of Northern Ireland. You're hopefully going to be the first um, Northern Irish captain in a um, championship um, next year. Again, we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, you're a, a one-club player with Cliftonville. How long have you been with Cliftonville then? So you played like, you know, right from underage level through to the seniors. Well, in fact, then there was no underage level. There was just the seniors and that was it. Um, so I've been there since it was... 
13 and yeah, we, we just kind of went in with the senior squad then. Um, although we did break a few rules because um, back then you had to be 14 before you could play senior team. But I'm almost sure I slid in there a few months before my 14th birthday. Um, but yeah, one club, um, I've always been there. We, we were actually Newington girls first and then Tiftonville came and approached us and basically asked us to, to come along and, and take their name as a female club. Um, as a female section of the club, sorry, and um, we did. Um, I think that was in 2002. Mm -hmm. It actually was 2002 because we're actually coming up to our 20th um, anniversary year next year, which is exciting. Um, yeah, so. And then, of course, part of the, the Northern Ireland team that, that started competing to take part in these tournaments, Vafi Wiley. And um, the, I mean, the last year has just been incredible. And, and you've captained the, the team through all of that, um, on a more sort of day-to-day -day basis, um, as a coach, you've done stuff at Cliftonville and you work with the IFA. You're, um, what is your, your official title is um, Girls Participation Officer, but you're essentially like an ambassador for women's football through the IFA, would that be? Well, I, I started um, with the IFA as an ambassador, a women's football ambassador, and I was, um, Alfie Riley was, uh, was um, and ahead of that, myself and Julie Nelson were the two ambassadors, and basically our jobs were to raise awareness of the game. Um, and I actually moved from that role, um, and I'm now a girls' participation officer, which is focusing heavily on creating opportunities for young girls. Um, a massive program for us at the minute is our Shooting Stars program, which aims to, to just to make sure every young girl in Northern Ireland gets a chance to. To fall in love with the game. Um, we have centres all across Northern Ireland. Obviously, before the pandemic hit, um, we had thousands of girls taking part in a weekly basis. And, you know, the programme was really getting so exciting because the number of girls we have playing. Um, and then, so hopefully in the next kind of few months, we'll have that kickstarting again. And, and then another programme, which is brand new, uh, um, is linked with UEFA is our Disney, our Disney Playmakers program, which is, is such an exciting program because it links the, the Disney movies with, with football. And again, the aim is to inspire young girls to fall in love with the game. So, yeah, I, I, it's obviously something that really motivates me. So, that was the reason why I went for, for that new role. And yeah, I've been in it for a few years and yeah, it's exciting. What a joke to talk uh, on this topic. Yeah. I should explain, by the way, um, I don't know if you can hear it, but that, my dog is snoring loudly in the background and um, I did everything to get um, my one-year-old daughter um, out of the house but forgot about the dog so just in case you're wondering what's going on <laughs> usually professional as I am and um, just to explain who I am I um, obviously don't have the history or the collection of women's football that you guys do uh, for obvious reasons but um, I, I do have a, a affinity um, with the NAWFA I founded a football team in 2017 um, who now have two um, senior teams in the NAWFA first and second so the Belfast Ravens and so um, enamoured with women's football and in, enjoying that hugely rewarding um, role as found in that club and coaching them um, I went on to publish a book uh, about a young female footballer from Northern Ireland who plays um, for Northern Ireland and plays for an imaginary underage version of the Belfast Ravens so um, that's kind of my qualification to be here but you guys are going to do most of the of the, of the um, that's for sure. You know, the last sort of few years and the last even few months, actually, and how women's football has just completely exploded um, in Northern Ireland. Um, but we're going to go back to you guys playing alongside each other at Cliftonville. So when are we talking? When would that have been happening? I think around 2009, I joined Cliftonville. Obviously, Marissa was already there. Um, but I do remember going up to like a pre-season, I think it was early 2009, Marissa, and we played kind of five-a-side, just small-sided. And she, I was just totally in awe of Marissa, and I mean that genuinely, at her incredible ability. And, and oh, I just remember her ridiculous effort in this small-sided game. <laughs> <laughs> So Marissa, now you, That's nice you, to hear. you were blown away by her. That's... <laughs> like we, um, yeah, like uh, it's interesting, like thinking back then, because I mean, one thing about Cliftonville, we were always the underdogs, weren't we? Like 
every game that we went into, it was, we genuinely give our heart and soul for the club. Like, we were never one of the top teams in the country. Like, we, we obviously are now playing the Premier League, but back then, we were such a close-knit team. We were, the friendships, like, there's, there's players that I, I'm still friends with, you know, that, that I play, like, the likes of Nicola's um, sister-in-law, Joanne McCarthy. Like, I played with Joanne from I was 13, Right up until two years ago, when she when she retired, um, so we did, we had this incredible friendship. Um, I absolutely loved that, that those years in the club um, because we kind of grew with each other. We were thirteen years old, and we were still you know playing together when we were in our twenties and in our late thirties, and yeah, we just experienced so much together. But it was a really good time then for the club because I actually think um, maybe a year. I don't know if you were still involved, Nicola, the year that we had won the championship and the, the cup, because it was actually the year that me and Joanne went to America, because um, we actually missed the, the final, of the cup final, and we missed the whole, like, winning the league and, you know, the whole excitement right up. Um, and that year, we actually didn't get beat in any games, and that was the year we promoted in the Premier League. Um, although we did drop down the season after because we weren't at that level just yet, but um, yeah, it was a really good time, a really good time at the club then, wasn't it? What was um, the landscape yeah. like though um, across the country? Um, I suppose it's a case of you know compare and contrast to to twenty twenty one. So how many active teams was there playing in Northern Ireland around? I mean, and keep it in mind, we're only going back, um, you know, whatever, thirteen years. How many teams was there in Northern Ireland, and what was the um, what, what were the not the facilities, but what was the encouragement that you were getting? Well, there were four divisions, weren't there? Marissa? There were four divisions back then, with about maybe would you have eight and about eight? I, was, I think yeah, around eight teams in each division. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if the top the top division had less. But I know I it was a championship, there was that Yeah, I think the top maybe it had a slightly less, six or seven maybe. So it was quite a small, I mean, obviously things have changed in between and there's been various different structures, haven't they? They've kind of regionalised it and not regionalised it in various things. But, I mean, certainly then there was about four divisions because I, I actually started my career at Belfast United, um, which is now Glen Torren, and then I, a team formed, Marissa, do you remember Northland Raiders? Yes, yes. Um, it formed near me um, in Yonard. So we had to start in the fourth division and climb through. And we went fourth to third, second to first in consecutive seasons. Um, and it was a husband and wife team started, uh, Stephen and Kim Funston, who've done a lot for women's football, you know, uh, who were doing a lot at that time. And um, so I do remember the four divisions because we went through them kind of, you know, uh, fourth to first. Um, but as I suppose in terms of the, the encouragement, I mean, I don't know what you think, Marissa, but I think it was certainly still a very small, you know, environment. Everybody knew everybody, which was lovely, as Marissa said, in many ways. I mean, the friendships, like Marissa, you know, I still have from the game, and you kind of went through the years with people. Ashley Hutton was in the team that I played for at Northland Raiders um, for all of those years. And, um, but, I mean, there was... So the likes of Stephen and Kim Bunsen, the encouragement was great, but there's like I had to travel to Belfast from Newton Arts initially because there was no team around me, and it wasn't until I went to um to secondary school and found some girls were play, playing in Belfast that I went to play for for BU for Belfast United. A girl Claire Ray actually took in, in, uh, introduced me to it. So there was still wasn't lots of options where there was there and there certainly wasn't in, in the younger age groups, you know. Uh, so your options I suppose were quite limited. Um but it was competitive. I mean it was very it, it was still very competitive. Yeah, it definitely was. Um, but like, just as you say, when we when we were growing up, um, as I said earlier, 13 was when I first got introduced to my first girls team. Where I was in West Belfast, there was no girls teams in, the, in my area. Um, and now, don't get me wrong, I, I had, I played in the street with the boys and um, I actually have friends um, who loved football, like, as in female friends who, who loved to play football too. And my youth leader um, used to, 
who lost into a tournament every year. It was an indoor 5SA tournament in Maysfield. Um, can you remember that? Because it I remember. Been that. Yeah. Um, oh, so I forgot the we, we were just a bunch of a bunch of kids from Davis area, um, and yeah, our youth worker just put us into it every year. And I remember always being so excited about it, like that excited that you actually couldn't sleep the night before. You know, you couldn't wait until the Saturday morning to, to go and play in this tournament. Now we got absolutely hammered. Um, every time we went but it wasn't even about that it was about just playing and, and yeah having having the crack um, in northern ireland in 2008 let's say um am i right in saying that they weren't um trying to qualify for tournaments at that point so whenever you go back so whenever you think about it so 2004 was when the senior women's team got reestablished again because there was no senior women's team when we were growing up in, in the different age groups. Um, so 2004 is whenever they established it again. They actually, do you know then, they actually went to the Algarve Cup, but they had to pay £250 um, to, to go to this tournament. Now, I say they, um, I was in um, America at the time, so I wasn't involved. Um, it's interesting, but, you know, Julie Nelson, the place with the senior women's team, she has this incredible memory of, like, every game. I mean, she, she's our most caps in, in the team, and, you know, her memory is amazing. And, yeah, you asked her any game, any goal scorer's name, anything, and, and, and she knows. But, um, yeah, the, the history started in 2004, and then... Um, when you look back again, the the first World Cup qualifiers that we actually entered was in two thousand and seven, and then which meant the first Euro that we entered was in two thousand and nine. So you're speaking two thousand and eight. Yeah, well, two thousand and nine was the first time that they actually entered entered until your qualification. So the expectation there it was really about being in the in the tournament, which was massive, obviously for for the team the. Because I'm almost sure you had to qualify to actually get into the qualifiers um, because we were a new, newly established country. Um, so to even be in those qualifying stages was, um, yeah, was a great thing in itself um, back then. And what was the pool like um, of players? You know, it, uh, was there any players outside of Northern Ireland that were being called up to, to represent their country? Or was it everybody from the likes of, of Clifton Bell and... No, I I can't recall back then. Um, I know a lot of players um, in those years started to go to the likes of America. That was the big, the opportunity that the, the female um, players had here and was to go get a scholarship and be in that full-time environment. Um, so I know the likes of Sarah McFadden, Ashley Hutton, um, Julie Nelson, naming loads of other ones, um, including myself. Um, we all jetted off and <laughs> to America and, and and played there and um but I think in those early days it was all the home base players. Um but we had fantastic talent back then. I mean obviously we do now still but um I mean the talent was was definitely there. Um I think it was more getting players to commit. Um because I know I myself um the commitment wasn't wasn't something that I, I was able to do back then. Um so I know there was a lot of players that almost didn't play because of those that had other things going on and um, it was just in its infancy um, but you've obviously got the likes of your Julie Nelson and Ashley Hutton who both have over 100 caps and have both been there from, from the very beginning. And I mean there wasn't this anywhere near when I mean, you're talking about players having to, to pay to play essentially there wasn't really the sponsorship or support necessarily from the IFA other than you know, just finding the team in the first place or, or refinding them? Yeah, like, um, I think the big thing was to get it started back up and, and obviously they invested in getting a, a, a new manager in, um, Alfie Riley came in and, and, yeah, I think that was the beginning. Well, it was the beginning of um, our, our pathway then. Um, and as you know, like many things have happened between then and now that's helped the, the game um, be where it is today. Was there a t an early tipping point? Because, um, I mean, the narrative to me suggests that this is, it's, it's been such a recent thing that it's just gone completely um, off the chart in the last couple of years. Um, 
you know, to, to obviously on the brink of qualification and um, the coverage on TV. And, and that's not just in Northern Ireland, but, you know, across network BBC and, and covering the WSL. Um, but previous to that, um, in the kind of, whatever it might be, in the kind of late noughties, was there, was there an early tipping point where, where things started to change and there seemed, you know, there was a bit of momentum gathering? Or has it all just been in the last two or three years? I think the momentum has basically been growing since since way back then in 2009. Like, slowly but surely, we've, we've built up. Like, um, so back at Cliftonville, um, I remember actually helping out um, with the, the younger age groups um, whenever I was playing for the senior team. So there was girls, young girls leagues, um, a few years after I started to, to, to play for the club. Um, now, in terms of, it wasn't, I don't think it was league, sorry, it was more tournaments. So the young girls would have had like a few weeks in the summer or the random tournament, you know, but there was at least opportunities for, for some girls to play at a younger age. Um, and I think from that, the club started to grow then. Um, and then, I, to be honest, I think the tipping point um, just thinking back, I think the tipping point for it all was when um, Gail Redman, when she came into post, um, she actually started to build on the leagues for the younger the younger players. So, for example, our younger players um, before this went every summer up to the last playing fields um, and played a six-week um, league, let's call it. Um, so they got six weeks of, of competitive football, um, but that was it. That's all they had was within the club environment. Um, but when Gail Redmond came in, um, one of the first things she done was made sure that girls had more opportunities to, to compete in, in matches. So the the league then they started to play from um, in the winter, so from September right through till June, like the like the males. Um, so I think that was that was key because once you establish um, that the, the, the players can play matches every week for most of the year, then you start to attract players to the club because you know everyone wants to play games. We love obviously we love training and we love being in that training environment, but matches is really the thing that you you, you yeah you wait on. It's match day, that match day feeling, and that's what uh, excites you. So. Yeah, for me, just looking back, I think it was those um, leagues starting up for, for the younger generation. And um, that just meant that the clubs then had wanted to grow and the clubs wanted to get more girls involved and have that clear pathway within um, a club environment. For So now, I mean, most clubs have um, girls as young as five-year-old playing on a weekly basis on whatever kind of... Um, small set of games that, that it goes on, but I know within the Irish Football Association as well that they have small set of games in every council area. So again, it's it's opportunities for for females to play um, most of the year. Nicola, watching as you would have been, um, I guess from Manchester and, and part of that setup, and and um, of course in Manchester City have or have eventually ended up kind of trailblazers as such. <laughs> Um, do you think it's fair to say that Northern Ireland was a little bit behind? Because I'm not sure that's the case. It sort of feels like um, it, it was slow to take off and, and, and kind of go from, you know, very much right in people's consciousness to the point where the BBC are covering matches live. Um, were we generally on that path with the rest of the UK? Or did you feel like with the Northern Ireland was a little bit behind? Maybe a bit of both. Like I would have obviously kept contact whilst I was in Manchester with a lot of the girls playing here, and um, I played for Queen's University as well. And a lot of the girls I played with there be very friendly with and still involved in the game. And um, I suppose I, I would say I, I agree with Marissa. I think the seeds, like a lot of people, certainly from a media perspective, would credit the, the 2016 Olympics and the 2019 World Cup as real kind of, you know, highlights. That's from a media perspective and a and a kind of exposure 
perspective. Um, but I, I agree with Marissa. I think those seeds were really planted, you know, slightly earlier in terms of the, the game itself and putting those structures in place, providing pathways. That was all starting to really kind of gain momentum. Um, I think, as you say, at Manchester City, you know, whenever I first moved across, you know, in 2011-12 season, the the girls weren't, you know, they weren't part of the club. There was a Manchester City women's team, but they weren't part of it. And I actually trained with them for a while uh, before realising that, A, my uh, speed and fitness maybe once <laughs> weren't what they once were. And also, I was, <laughs> I was working in football, so it didn't really, you know, allow for, for me to play that much. But um, I, I don't know, I think maybe England did accelerate quite fast is what I would say, you know, so I think I would say that it, certainly in Northern Ireland, like Marissa said, the seeds were, were kind of planted um, as they were in England, but I think almost once England kind of took off, like the girls, uh, the women's team came into Man City in 2014 and they definitely, as you say, David, they were trailblazers and I suppose in many ways still are. And you could see a noticeable change from 2014. And then things kind of went really fast, if that makes sense. That's how I kind of see it. And I'm not saying that, you know, we're catching up, but, you know, I think still we're um, on a journey here. Um, but I think in England, it just kind of took off, you know, and the various things that we're seeing here now, you know, happen quite quickly. Um, so I do feel like there's still room for, for, for that growth here and we're seeing it already, which is amazing. And as Marissa said, the, the opportunities to play at a young age and the pathways are, are, are huge and you know, we're seeing that happening. Um, but I suppose in England, they're just further ahead in terms of, as I say, things like sponsorship and, and the growth of, of the game as a whole. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, we're definitely getting here uh, in Northern Ireland. And as you rightly pointed out at the start of the, the, the conversation, you know, certainly in the past couple of years, there seems to be a real uh, hunger for it, um, which is just brilliant. I always laugh. I come from a um, look from a music background, and I always sort of say, you know, if certain people start talking about certain bands, I know that that those bands will go on to be absolutely massive. So if you know guys that I play football with and maybe don't go to very many gigs, or you know, even my mum starts talking about, for example, Ryan McMullen, singer songwriter from Northern Ireland, I go, oh, he's he's sorted. He's going to be massive if he can get to those people. Um, and I'm starting to notice that with um, the likes of Marissa and, and Rachel Furness over in um, playing in Liverpool and Simone and, and all um, all of a sudden um, an awful lot of people who might have been into football but would have no interest in women's football know who all those players are and are aware of oh you know who are they going to get in the playoff all of a sudden everyone's an expert on European women's football and, <laughs> and um, everyone's suddenly got an opinion on Kenny Shields and even being able to name the Northern Ireland manager. And um, it's, I mean, I, I get to dine out in the fact that I was just ahead of the curve, like just by a couple of years, uh, getting involved as I did. But it's so um, incredible to see it happening and, and incredibly um, uh, long overdue. And I don't mean to sound kind of patronizing because, you know, five years ago, I wasn't really that, I wasn't really that tuned in to what was going on, but now it's, it's, it's everywhere. And I can't quite put my finger on why that might be, but I guess the most um, kind of the nicest way to look at it is just because the team are really strong at the moment and they've got to, to a point where they are one game away or two games away from um, from qualifying for a major championship. And of course, whenever a team are doing well, the BBC, you know, BBC don't want it to, to put out Northern Ireland and beat it one by Switzerland, but they do want to put out Northern Ireland hammering for a while or or picking up an unexpected away result against Belarus as they did during that campaign. So of course the demands there, and the de of course people want to speak to the captain. They want to, they know who she is and they know who the top scorer is and all of those things. But you're saying, Marissa, that that's been kind of cooking for quite a while, and the quality's always been there. So, uh, so what is what has happened then in the last couple of years? Is what's the recent thing that's happened where everyone, where my mom and dad know who Marissa Callahan is? Um, yeah, I think the awareness, the awareness around the game has increased massively and you, I know you mentioned them earlier at the very beginning, but um, Electric Ireland um, is a massive sponsor of the women's game in Northern Ireland and I honestly think they have, they are game changers in this um, and they have played a massive role in terms of um, showing 
people that women's football is here, um, it's here to stay, um, showing them that there's a pathway for kids as young as four right through um, to senior international level. And, and actually, um, last or two years ago, it was they, they'd done a billboard um, which went up across Belfast, and there was um, a representation of each age group um, within women's football. So I was actually there myself. So I was there as a senior women's um, player that had uh, under 19, under 17, had a NIWFA player, a Niffle League player, a young shooting star, you know, had this representation of, of the women's game. And um, so, yeah, I think they have been um, real trailblazers in terms of what they've they've helped us with. Um, so people are aware of the game. And I just think everything's almost just came together perfectly. Like, because obviously they've came on board. Um, we... The Irish Football Association are investing heavily um, in the women's game um, at all levels and, and obviously getting um, a new senior women's manager in um, and Kenny Shields and his team coming in, um, I think it was 18 months ago, has really helped the senior side kick on and, until another level. So I just think, and, and then obviously Lex Yourselves and, and BBC, BBC's been fantastic and so has a lot of the broadcasters and in terms of wanting to get to know players. Sure. And, um, Nicola, from a broadcaster's point of view, why are the BBC um, suddenly doing all of this? I mean, you know, why did the BBC go to CV and um, broadcast those games live, both domestically and internationally? Um, why do you think they did that? Well, I think from my kind of point of view, I think, first of all, when I would say just pick up on the point why things have changed, I think the clubs getting involved with the women's teams as well has really, really helped. I mean, certainly in England with Man City coming in and you had Arsenal and Chelsea and, you know, clubs just really bringing the, the, the women into the club, you know, uh, and making them officially part of the club. I think that's been huge as well. Um, and I think, as Marissa said, you know, the, the kind of hunger is there. Uh, and once, you know, people are introduced to, you know, the players and, as you say, get to know them, get to know their backgrounds, get to know who they are, it's all about making that contact as well. And I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's such a fast-growing sport. And um, as I said, that's probably been hu huge in England in, in many ways. Um, and we've seen the coverage, you know, grow there. But I think just as the game has kind of picked up, I think, you know, as as, as the hunger comes from an, an audience perspective, you know, and, all, and, and just the game growing. I mean, you know, the... the the fact that there's, you know, professional leagues, you know, a lot of the girls and, well, the, the FA, WSL's fully pro, um, you know, it, it, as the game has grown, everything has grown around it, you know, and I think media is just kind of part of that kind of puzzle with, you know, sponsorship has grown, media has grown, the game has grown and the hunger's there and the audience is there to, to, to kind of feed, you know, what they want. So I think um, it's all, as Marissa said there, it's all kind of come together, you know, Know, from all angles, which is just kind of elevated every part of the, the jigsaw, if you like. Um, and, and the competition, you know, was great as well, you know. The competitions, and as we say, not that it wasn't great in our day, Marissa, because <laughs> we had some, some cracker games, we, you know, but I think the level of competitions there, and, uh, you know, as as we show more games, that it just, everything feeds, you know, in everything part feeds the other part if that makes sense um, and the more we see as you say the, the girls the more they become household names and you make that connection which is a huge part of football as we know uh, you know it, it grows together and, and, and you're then you know kind of feeding that audience demand um, and, and I think that's only going to get bigger and bigger. If Northern Ireland qualify for the Euros or when Northern Ireland qualify uh, for Euro 2021 or 2022 as it'll be now I mean that's it. Like, it's just going to be household name time. I mean, I mean, honestly, I mean, it's going to be the same. 2016 was a complete sea change. And I always argued um, uh, growing up that, that Northern Ireland qualifying for um, a major championship would be just brilliant for Belfast in general and for Northern Ireland in general. And, and that they're, you know, politically and, and the people would just make, it would become more about the football and stuff. And, and, 2016, it felt like, um, you know, obviously Will Gregg and, and Kyle Lafferty and all those players, everybody knew who they were. And 
it, it didn't, it, it, there, there wasn't the same sort of stigmas that there might have been politically with following Northern Ireland. And it was year zero. And ever since then, you know, there's been something there to build on. And of course, the, the senior men team have been very unlucky not to kind of um, literally build on that and go to other tournaments. But this is the moment whenever that's going to happen with the women. And it's only, you know, what, five, six years later. But getting to that championship, surely that's going to be that. It's just going to be right. But it's not going to be a, 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 it's not going to be an obscure, slightly niche appeal thing anymore. It's just going to be massive. Is that what you're expecting, Nicola, if this happens? Well, I think no matter what happens um, over the course of, of these two playoffs, I just think we need to really drive forward regardless. As you say, David, I think we've come to a point where, you know, we've brought the girls into, into people's lives, into people's living rooms. We are, you know, the girls, sorry, are inspiring young girls. I mean, if if the, the squad makes the, the tournament, I mean, that is just a whole other level of, you know, incredible, you know, I, I can't even think, I mean, I don't know how, if I feel like that, I don't know how it is, to be honest with you, but, you know, I can't even begin to, I mean, even after, you know, the last couple of, um, of group games, it was just, incredibly emotional I think for everyone involved and because Marissa and I have grown up with the game and we have been in and around it since we were maybe 12 or 13 you know it's just a so much emotion and um, and there's so much to celebrate and I think we all have uh, a responsibility therefore that no matter what happens in these two playoffs and as I say if the girls go through and you know but even if they don't I think we need to use this time and even the playoffs and and everything that's happened um you know in the past few years to really drive the game on both domestically and uh, and on the international um side of things as well because as Marissa said earlier you know the talent is really there and the talent's always been there I mean Marissa said there's been some incredible players in our time um I, you know it, it's frightening really the level of talent that there's been now we have pathways and opportunities for those girls and you know to have people like marissa who's you know just been an incredible uh i hate we're using the word servant i don't mean that you know but just dedicated herself to the game and girls like julie and ash Hutton and you know we need to celebrate all that this is but also use it to push on as marissa does day in day out um, you know, and I think now we've, we've got that, you know, as well. And even from a media perspective, I think we, you know, speaking to the girls, you know, more and, you know, getting them on. You know, we've had Gail Redmond do some co-coms and various things like that. You know, we using all of this to really now push on and, you know, um, and, and just build because the talent's there and everything else around the game is building too. So it's actually a very exciting time for us, I'm sure. You agree? I just feel it was yes, very exciting time. <laughs> it's like we've been going, oh my yeah. god, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, so sorry about the extra pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, like, just um, touching on what Nicholas says, like, when we when we were younger, being a professional footballer, being a professional female footballer, footballer wasn't, wasn't seen, like, it wasn't heard of. Um, so I think a massive um, role that we've played um, as a senior women's team in the last number of years is we've um, started to create role models for those young girls to say, do you know what, I can actually, one, wear the green shirt and be an international player, um, and two, go overseas and be a professional player and make this as my job. Like, you've seen, um, obviously, we've got Simone McGill and Rachel Furness um, at the minute who's in the squad, both professional players in England, um, and we've seen Demi France, Megan Bell, Chloe McCarran, all these players going over, um, Lauren Wade as well, going overseas and, and um, getting a job professionally playing football. And when young players see that um, on their doorstep, then they can start to believe I can do that. You know, so it's the younger generation as well is taking it to another level in terms of I want to aspire to be, to be that, that player and, and have those role models. So I think. Um, having role models in the game is, is hugely important and um, I don't even want to think about what it's going to be like on the 13th of April if we can do 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 what we want to do and, and yeah um, qualify for these Euros um, we will give it our heart and soul and we will like, play with every inch of 
or being the, the make it happen because I just know because the game has exploded already um, for what we've achieved in those playoffs. Can you imagine what we could do for those young players um, aspiring to be, to be football, a professional footballers or wearing the red shirt? Can you imagine what we can do if we qualify next year? Like we, we could hopefully do with the men on 2016 and just inspire a whole nation um, of, of girls coming to love the game and yeah, my heart's starting to beat a bit fast here. Thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. With Kenny to do an extra team talk because she can, yeah, she did it so much better than I tried to just. Uh, <laughs> uh, you don't need to be told that. I mean, he's obviously no. every player knows that. Um, I just want to talk about a couple of um, things before we before we finish. The first thing I want to talk about is um, d- just the history of the club that I run is and and how. That ties in with this. So whenever we set up um, the Ravens in 2017, as I explained at the start, it was um, girls mucking about who had never played football before. Um, half a dozen women literally hadn't kicked the ball. A couple of maybe played a bit of rugby school or something. And then they went, actually, um, you know, we enjoyed that. It was much more fun, much more fun way of, of getting um, getting some exercise than, than going running or, you know, spin classes or whatever um, they might have been doing. So we set up a, a kick around because there was literally nowhere in Belfast where they could go and just have a bit of a kick around. So we set up one ourselves. And then whenever we asked, did anyone else want to come along? It completely blew my mind. The level of interest from women um, in their 20s, in their, you know, in their 30s, mums who had never kicked a football before but always wanted to and had, had never had the opportunity. And, and we, we just had this ridiculous waiting list and it just got to the point where we were going, well, how do we kind of pick, you know, we're not going to be picking people necessarily on ability because that was never the point of the club. It was always, it was, if it was going to be an ability, it would be the people who could prove that they were total beginners. In fact, that's literally what it was. And we would, we would have had a couple of hundred people knocking down our door to play. And then we steadied the ship with whatever it was, 50 or 60 people. And we've got two, um, two teams and with a bunch of players who weren't getting enough football and were toying with the idea of having a sort of a development team or something like that. And my point is, you know, going beyond inspiring young women, young girls to play football, just making football something that women of any age of any ability can play in the same way. I mean, I'm rubbish at football. I'll always get a five-side game during the week. I'll always get a game for the very lowest team in the club that I play for because there's hundreds and hundreds of guys teams in Northern Ireland. So how do you do that? How do you make it not that big a deal to, to, to drive past low rag or to drive past and, and there's a kick around is it's five side, six side game just with a load of girls, a load of women playing football. How does, how does that happen? And that's nothing to do with inspiring people to, to get to a certain level to become professional footballers. It's just normalising the concept of just a load of, you know, load of people playing football. It's a really good question, actually, because um, I still play five aside, but I play once a week with all guys <laughs> and myself, and sometimes one other girl. Um, but I am involved in a in a group as well, a WhatsApp group of girls who kind of a collection of girls who've played you know, from when we were small and aren't really playing for a club. Um, it's an over thirties group. Not that I'm over thirty, I'm just there to you know make up numbers. <laughs> um, and I, just before lockdown, really in the years since we've kind of well, we came back a couple of years ago from Manchester, but I came home and I wanted to play. I did play a bit of club initially, but this group's been great. But I suppose it's interesting because it is quite a specific niche group of girls who have played, if that makes sense. Um, so it may not be as readily available as you mentioned, David, as your lots of different five-a-side, you know, male groups that you be, you're you part of. But I still play with guys. I, I've always, like Marissa, I'm sure I've always played with, with guys and with men now, you know. And um, there's a, a once a week I play with a very uh, competitive group of men as well. But it's interesting that you say maybe, like my daughter's, for example, I have two girls, six and three, and, you know, maybe by the time they're hitting, you know, their, my age, you know, maybe that won't be the case. Maybe there will be as many 
options to play fantasy with with women than, than there are men and um, you know as I say there are options out there but generally I suppose it's quite uh, you know the group of people or you've been you know you've been playing with a group of people but um, my daughter Sophie actually she did walk into the room I was watching a Premier League match I think it was last week and she walked in and she said who's this mummy playing tonight and I said who it was um, I think it was Man City actually and she said oh the women or the men and I thought that's you know like that's amazing that that just mercy you know that just would not have been that was not our lives you know and to think that she asked that straight away i was just like you know that tells its own story and i hope you know we see that play out as you say as in you know a, a group of girls and women will be more common than it already is you know and just our, I mean, that's the point yeah. with the story of the Ravens. I, I, as I say, I, it completely blew me away. And the reason why they wanted to play it is because it was an environment where, because the problem with a lot of these teams, and it's fantastic, I mean, we, now, so we're talking about, you know, 2010 and there was four divisions. There's now six divisions in the NAWFA and then the NIFL division as well. So there's almost double the amount of teams um, in Northern Ireland, senior teams. I mean, so, I mean, that's how much that, we didn't really say that, but that's how much that's came on. But those teams aren't, I don't want to say they're not welcoming, because I don't mean they're not welcoming, welcoming, of course they're welcoming, and the environment is fantastic, but if you're a beginner and you rock up to play for tw even like 22nd who are in our division, or Dramara, or Balma Hinch, it, you know, there's such a gap. It's not like, you know, I'm, I'm rubbish at football, but I can rock up and kind of mm. hold me own. Do you know what I mean? But that's why there was demand for our team, because... They knew that if they'd never played football before, that they could get into it and kind of, you know, learn the basics if they, hadn't, if they hadn't done it at school. And that's what that's what really shocked me that you know there, there wasn't anywhere for them to sort of go. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's something that would be amazing yeah. to see, but that's maybe a little bit further down the line. Um, David, just... I think it's important to remember, like, sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. You sorry, can echo them and sorry. go back to Marissa. I'll just finish up my really quick up. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think, it, you know, it's really important to remember at our age when we were growing up, it really, really, really wasn't the norm. I mean, I remember being in the, in the playground playing with the boys and you still got like a sore thumb, you know what I mean? And it really wasn't the norm. Um, you know, so I think that's what you're saying, you know, and that, that's why I suppose those five side groups are now quite niche. But I think, and I'll pass over to Marissa for this because she knows a lot more than I do. But, you know, my daughter actually this week in school had a, a coach come in like Marissa has done as well and does and and had football lessons again which wouldn't have happened so it's all about that grassroots and 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 normalizing it you know, not as you get older trying to keep girls involved as well and you know there was a period I went through where I was almost a little bit embarrassed about saying well, I play football and you're kind of going through those awkward years but when you normalize that so young that is happening in schools and the grassroots you know clubs and things that will really really help you know just normalize the whole game as girls grow more so I know you'll know a lot more about that than I do. Yeah we'll just touch on um, obviously the association is invested in, in women's football at all levels and football for all we've all heard that um, but we at the minute I know it's only Belfast but at the minute there's a back in the game um, league that happens and it's actually aimed at women um, but, well, let's say over 35, but I mean, if you're 30 or 31, I think you can join or any age, really. But it's, it started off as a kind of pathway for those players that um, retired competitively and wanted somewhere to go to just um, basically keep the friendships, create new friendships and have female connection within sport. And the, the IFA um, came up with this back in the game. I know they have it with the boys as well, um, but the girls is in Conde and um, the five side pitches up there, um, and that was happening on a weekly basis. And again, as you mentioned, it was just somewhere for for um, females to go. And the main thing was uh, they were obviously getting their, their their exercise in, but it was basically having those female connections. Um, but yeah, as Nicholas says, um, at grassroots level. We have Latin play officers again throughout Northern Ireland who go into the schools and they um, they de they deliver um, thousands of sessions to to young girls and boys with throughout the country. So I think the more we grow the game um, at grassroots level, we have more girls playing. Then they will win the clubs. The clubs will grow, um, and yeah, they'll be 
I mean, we have to think of, yes, there's a competitive league, um, but sometimes girls just want to be there um, because of the, the connections that they have, as you know, as you speak about Belfast Ravens. So it's making sure that we cater for, for everyone and every girl who, who and woman who wants to play. And yeah, I think the association is, is, definitely does have that nailed down. And again, as it grows, there'll be more um, players to, to kind of build on those programs um, throughout the country. That's incredible. I mean, that's that's the solution, really, isn't it? It is not. It's just something that it's that's not going to happen overnight because it's not <laughs> it's not possible because it's a generational thing, really, and it's yeah. a complete change in attitude. I would will say though that that Colin Glenn tournament we um, very happily took part in that, and um, the women that were playing were on some of them were just unbelievable, and because we we sent up a team who weren't getting action in in the league. Yeah. It's like, can we go back to playing in the league? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And so it was, it was, and, and, and it wasn't all of that, but it only takes three or four outstanding players and they'll just dictate the entire match. So they were sort of back to square one, but they loved it and I loved it yeah. because it was, it had that, el- that little element of, of, um, of, fun and camaraderie, which you don't get in the league. I mean, I prefer that level of, of um, and I always, the, the Ravens laugh, I always say, you're not here to have fun and we're not here to be all, you know, we're here to bust ourselves and, you know, you have the fun afterwards reflecting on how much you gave in the match and stuff and that's kind of my philosophy if I have one. Yeah. Um, and Glenn was a bit looser, you know, yeah. it, was, it was more fun. So it was good that there is a bit of that, but the yeah. standard was outstanding and it maybe ties into what you're saying about the standard has always been good because yes um a lot of those women were retired and maybe hadn't played football in 10 years but they were incredible i think it was yeah i think it was important whenever they they started that program to to try and keep um women within the the game Mm -hmm. because you don't want those um players to just stop playing and that's it um, and again, um, it helps with the exercise, mental health, the connections, and you get so much out of it. Um, so yeah, I think it was a fantastic initiative. It was brilliant, really, really brilliant. Um, uh, yeah, and those little cages up in Colin Glen are, are great anyway. It's just brilliant facilities. Yeah, yeah, so, it's great. I think as well, the other thing is the more normal it becomes at a young age, you know, we've traditionally seen a really heavy drop off around the teenage years in women's sport in general, not just in um, in, in football, but I think, you know, as it, as it grows and even seeing your mum play or your auntie or here it may be, it is more, uh, the more it normalises, you'll hopefully, you know, prevent that drop off, that heavy, heavy drop off Marissa if you know what I mean when you kind of you know when girls hit those teenage years it's it, it's not awkward you know it, it's just like oh this is just what I do you know which is very much uh, when I spent some time in America as well and it was one of the things that really hit me in America was it was like a badge of honour to play football like this was my pride and joy I'm not saying it wasn't for us but for uh, certainly for some girls I think there was a bit of an awkward spell and you kind of went in and out where she's just yeah. owning it and going this is what I do you know I think that um, at, at the teenage years, um, I think it's more who your friendship group is as well. So having friends who aren't interested in sport and are interested in other things, I think that can be tough for, for young um, females who um, enjoy sport because they're almost torn. They're, they have their football friends and then have their, their, their friends outside of football. And, you know, on a Saturday, if they have to go, um, if they go to play a match, but their other friends are going to in the town to shop, you know, they've always they've got these choices all the time, and um, I think that's um, tough for for girls in, in that age group because they're trying to find themselves and they want to be part of the. You know, you want to have lots of friends when you're younger. Let's let's call spade a spade, and you want to you know you want to be popular and you want everyone to love you. And um, yeah, I think that's a big. Um, I think for for young girls are almost torn, but I think sport is now seen as a not a cool thing. Could we say? I mean, people, um, yeah, it's a cool thing now to be fit and healthy, and you know, play sport, um, exercise, go to gym. You know, I think we're starting as a society, the the really and as females in society, um, it's like a cool thing to run in your your gym gear, and you know go to shops in your gym gear and I just think as a society it's actually becoming like a cool thing so hopefully um, as the generation kind of grows that that 
that um, that'll kind of fizz away for the females, and they'll not have to make choices, and it'll just be it'll be okay to go and play your sport, and and also be with your peers that don't like the sports. Um, Just uh, look at Rigsy's jumper, Marissa. Yeah. I wouldn't play for the reasons if I get a jumper like that. <laughs> oh, Nicola, you know. We didn't have cool jumpers like that growing up. Yeah, I know. I've been bullying you to try and get it to sort of finish your career. You know the way that. Um, top players, they sort of, you know, they, they're the twilight of their career. They go for a little small team and, and you know, be a big fish in a small pond. Um, obviously, Marissa, you're very welcome. That's uh, maybe a little bit further down the line. But Nicola, you know how much I want to get you done playing for the Ravens. We um, we're, are pushing for promotion to division. Listen, if I get one of those jumpers, sign me up. <laughs> He's in the jigsaw. Don't joke. But um, the last thing... It'll be like that, like... Carlos Tevez returning to Argentina, that yes. kind of vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of like, you know, like Roy Keane re returning to Cold Ramblers. That, that's the type of thing. David <laughs> Healy managing the that's, that's That's the type of look that I'm going for. Brilliant. Yeah. Sign me up. <laughs> after, to be sure. But the last thing I want to talk about, and I will let you go after this, um, to move away uh, you know, from the development and how, how much things have changed and just talk about the women's football um, as is and, and has always been, and what um, the guys' game can learn from it um, when it comes to uh, inclusion. And um, I mean, we on the show that I produce for the BBC, we did a special on, on um, LGBT plus the, the last couple of weeks, and we're not able to find a single um, footballer um, playing at, at a top level in Northern Ireland who was out, who was um, out as gay, and that was raising, well, what has happened? Is that, is that because there aren't any? That seems completely unlikely. It's surely much more likely, but not less horrifying, that they're, they're you know, they, they're, they're just not out, because they're known to be gay, among, maybe among their teammates, but they don't want to be publicly gay, and that's obviously hugely disappointing. Why, what can the guys learn from the women in that regard? Um, good question. Um, well, I can only kind of speak from my experience. Um, obviously, coming into women's football in my young teenage years, um, I, I mean, being a gay woman myself, I yeah, actually couldn't understand um, the thoughts and feelings that I was having at, at a young age. And um, I wouldn't say I, I struggled, but I, I struggled to understand um, what, what I was going through. But when I, when I, um, joined the, the women's football community. Um, it was actually amazing how normal it was and how open um, women were. Like, the, I mean, as we, we speak about connections and friendships and um, just being in that environment, it was just, it was probably the best thing to happen to me at such a young age to be put into that environment with, with women, women and girls um, who were the same. And, and um, yeah, um, we're obviously going through the same kind of thing that I was going through at such a young, young age and um, I'm so thankful for, for football for that because it's helped me grow and just embrace who, who I was at, at such a young age as well so yeah I was lucky enough in my early teenage years to, to understand um, a lot about, about it and I just think I think it's quite sad that men don't feel like they're able to because it's almost it's just normalised in the women's game. Like we, I don't think we need to stand up and you know shout it up from the rooftops because it's just normal. Um, where men, I think they they have a completely different experience than us. Unfortunately, um, I just think it's harder for men. I just I do. I just think it's harder for them. I mean, even within you know. It's harder for them to open up and speak about, you know, their feelings at the best of times. So, um, yeah, I think what they can take from the women's game is just basically being more open and and men need to create that safe, inclusive environment for for everyone and and help them understand that you know it's not a big deal. And I mean, I mean, we can get married now. It's it's not a big deal anymore. And in my opinion, um, yeah, not the way it was when we were younger, and it's completely flipped. And yeah, it's it's celebrated. I think um, more than anything. Imagine being a young teenage girl. Well, much you can imagine, you were a young teenage girl who um, was finding her in her feet in that regard, and 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 
you know, football helped you. Can you imagine being a young gay man, um, 15 or 16, who's blessed with wonderful football skills, joining um, his, his football team? It would be the exact opposite. It, it'd be going, this, you know what I mean? It would, yeah, like... It would, wouldn't help. It would potentially hinder. Now, that's maybe a little bit unfair because it does feel like, you know, I'm thinking about in you know, my generation. Yeah. It would have been on, God, just the last thing you'd want to do in a football team. Yeah. Maybe that's a little bit unfair and maybe things have come on to the point where it might not be and we should give young male football teams a bit more credit. Yeah, well, maybe it's just normalised now and, and people don't, you know, don't feel like they need to step out into the media and, and, and say it, maybe. But um, I would say how amazing would it be for that young boy who's obviously got some sport and talent to, to hear a Premier League player or a Niffle League player come out. I think that that's the, where we have to look at it, that if they came out, out openly as a gay man, then that would help inspire and help um, those young boys who are, are trying to understand, you know, um, who they are. Um, I think that would be a massive um, thing for them to think about, having that kind of role model for the lead young boys to look up to. Because as I said, I do think that it is a lot tougher for, for males um, than it is for females because within the sporting environment, it's um, it's just totally normalised. And yeah, that's, that's my experience. It is the elephant in the room in the men's game because, I mean, there's absolutely no way that there are no uh, gay men playing in the Premier League or in the um, in the Irish League. I mean, that seems absurd. So why? I mean, no one's obliged to, to, to as you say, to, to be out and to be talking about it. But surely knowing how helpful it would be for people in, in, in a similar book, people, these men would want to do that. Why has it not happened? It just seems... Yeah crazy to me that I mean, not a single one that I can think of well we, we would know because it would be such a big deal which in itself is unusual yeah but would it be a big deal I don't know well, no, I, it, it, I don't mean it would yeah. be a big deal I mean it would be it would grab headlines because yes it, yes be, yeah you know yeah. It certainly wouldn't be but you know it would just be but it would be a big deal because people would be going this is the first it's actually because it hasn't been spoken about before yeah I get what you're saying yeah absolutely um, it is crazy to think about it. It is absolutely crazy to think that there's not one meal um, that's been in, in uh, the media. It's crazy. That's that's what. What do you think, Nicola? Yeah, it's it, it's a really um, it's a really really interesting one. I think to Marissa's point, you know, I I've played football since I was knee high. I mean, in primary school, you know. So, and then moving on to play for. for girls and women's teams and it's I feel really really lucky like Marissa says because it wasn't even something I really thought about or really questioned it which just was and I, I feel really lucky that I had that experience because we genuinely didn't it, it didn't you know and even to this day I have some you know my best friends you know some in gay relationships some not and it was never you know it was never something in the women's game that we made a huge deal of it just was and you know, I suppose looking back that was you know that was quite unique when when as you say did you compare it with the men's um and I just feel really lucky that, that we had that experience Marissa and that we just kind of grew up with that um in terms of the men, I mean, as you say, it's um, it, it, it it is quite astonishing, really, that we don't have you know those that similar experience in the men's game, um, and it would be as you say, Marissa, for especially for for, for young boys, you know, to, to maybe have that to, to someone that that has kind of you know come out openly and um, you know and to, to the, and as you say, to, perhaps it's di different. We're I suppose not in the men's game on a day to day. Maybe it is different, and, and it would be great to think that it is. Um, but it would be great to have that, um, especially for young boys to have someone that you know um, almost speaks up, speaks about it, and, and just makes it like it was for us. Like it wasn't a big deal. And, you know, and it still isn't. And um, I did a documentary in the women's game at the end of last year, and I remember speaking to someone for it. And you know, it was almost we we, we picked up on that as well. It just you know, it, it was what it was, and and we just got on with it, and everybody was welcomed. And 
um, yeah, and, and that goes for, for gender and religion and everything. And I think the Women's Game has been brilliant for that and it has crossed a lot of things and it just, you know, I think that's what's lovely about it too, um, Marissa, is that we've, you know, we, every, everybody was there for the love of the game and is there for the love of the game. So um, if you're a young man as well and your, your love for the game, you know, it would just be lovely to think that um, that it wasn't an issue if, if that was, you know, if that was to come up. But it would be great to have, it would be great to have those those people kind of, sp- it just be spoken about, I suppose, like anything, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Said, it's, it's have it spoken about and, and you know, to normalise it again, you know, would, would be fantastic, really. So there we go, guys. Um, what have I learned? Um, I, I, I guess there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say work to be done because it's not a chore, but there's a lot of exciting times ahead. Um, not just um, at the sort of top level, but maybe just the, the, the concept of women's football. Um, Marissa, the best of luck these two games against Ukraine. Um, just incredible situation for you and your teammates to find yourselves in. Um, it just blows my mind that this, this is all, you know, you're on the brink of something so special. Um, we don't know exactly when the dates are, maybe you, you do, but um, those games are going to be streamed on the BBC. Nicola, no doubt you'll be heavily involved with that coverage. Marissa said her heart was starting to, you know, beat a little faster whilst talking about it earlier. Mine was genuinely doing the exact same, you know. I just, I really can't wait. And I just think even to get to this point, the girls have done themselves, the manager, everyone proud women's football in this country and you know i just I, I just can't wait i really can't wait no matter what happens they've they've absolutely you know broken boundaries and, and put women's football firmly on the map in northern ireland and this is only just the, the start so i can't wait and i just want to wish the girls the best of luck and uh, i just enjoy every bit of it and uh and just put a huge well done for for getting this far it's genuinely incredible Thank you. And we look forward to it. We're counting down the days, I think. Um, no, it's not long. Not long now. So. Everyone's going to have their favourite player. Everyone's going to have their their opinions that, that Kenny Sheehan has got something wrong, that such and such should, should be playing in this position. And I can see that all sort of starting to happen. And it's 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 really entertaining to see that. <laughs> yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, guys, thanks so much. It's, I've learned an awful lot talking to you. Um, I hope anybody watching has as well. Um, Marissa, follow um, uh, our scores, Belfast Ravens. You could be like our celebrity fan. You know who absolutely will do, <laughs> and yeah, then you can come along and cheer on your mate Nicola. He'll be um, <laughs> look forward to it <laughs> with, with the club, um, yeah, and and give us some words of wisdom. Good luck with the Ukraine games, Nicola, as well. Thank you so much for your time, and um, yeah, I mean, w- just go and watch those matches against Ukraine. As I said, they're going to be, um, and you'll see both Marissa and Nicola. So I guess that's what we want people to do, um, and just to get involved with their local club, cheer them on, whatever it might be. And um, yeah, and maybe we'll do this again in, in five years' time and look back at, at this being another big tipping point for women's football in Northern Ireland. Nicola and Marissa, thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks so much.